you came here because you were Harvard educated and came to run for mayor. Uh, Braddock had a lot of problems with crime and other things, correct? Well, I, I can't, I've been here for fift, over 15 years now. And what brought me here was the ability coming out of school to, to start some programming to work with young people. And then things evolved and things changed and, and then I ran for mayor and I've been mayor for about 11 years now. So that's how that's evolved. Uh, but the reason why I came here primarily was because um, I wanted to do something with my background in education to kind of work against the direction that I where I saw you know the country kind of head. And uh, you are very progressive. I think uh, I could be wrong, but you label yourself as democratic socialist. No, I don't label myself a democratic socialist, but I, I certainly ran the most progressive campaign in in uh, in my race uh, this past spring, um, and I, I don't really consider it progressive. Um, I, I I genuinely don't. I I look at, you know, can can you live off eight dollars and fifty cents an hour? You know, can you live off? I mean, when you ask people that, I don't care how conservative or how liberal they are, no one says, yes, you can. You can't support yourself and a family on that wage. So why do we in this country pretend that we can? Why, don't, why is living wage such a controversial subject? Uh, climate science, I mean, no one argues about the science of why cell phones work. Why are we as a country arguing about the cli you know, climate science? Um, marijuana legalization, alcohol kills thousands of people, uh, ruins countless families with addiction, uh, car crashes, uh, heroin, the opioid crisis, yet marijuana is illegal and we have people, we have citizens in our country imprisoned over marijuana and it's not legal. So, so maybe that might sound progressive or left, but to me that's just basic common sense and I genuinely don't understand as an electorate why we don't demand these things you know, of our society. And uh, tell me about Braddock because uh, when you came in, um, it wasn't doing so well. What, what well, kind of... Well, Braddock, Braddock has been through 40 years of just getting kind of torn apart, you know, um, at the time, maybe closer to 30. But my point is, is Braddock, like so many other places, kind of had its back turned on it by the country as a whole. And it lost 90% of its population and it really um, tore itself apart. And, and it's not just my community, you go up and down the Monongahela River here, the Mon Valley as it's called, and you're going to see community after community that's kind of um, lost its way, largely through no fault of, it, of its own. Um, and that is in part what's making Pennsylvania competitive with Trump this year is because that message that he's peddling is resonating in some of these areas you know out in western pennsylvania and that i think is what's making pennsylvania competitive and making uh myself and i think others nervous about the election here and uh with braddock in particular uh what you said it had its back turned on was it offshoring of jobs yeah it was it was everything i mean it's some things that not necessarily uh, we're done to it, but like suburbanization, for example, so you know, definitely impacted. But, but when you have massive deindustrialization and massive offshoring of jobs, you know, India, China, other places that are manufacturing steel, um, you're going to have a wholesale devastation of the local economy and the jobs that support it. And even today, you have the Chinese and other countries in Southeast Asia dumping their steel and even using, you know, ex espionage to hack trade secrets from the plant in U.S. steel. Um, and they've proven these cases in, in uh, court. But by the time the judgment goes through and something gets done, very little actually happens and more has already gone out the door, so to speak. So, um, you know, U.S. steel and other companies deserve, I think, a stronger advocate. And, um, and I know what it would do to our town if, if the mill closed from a property tax standpoint, but mostly just you know, from a pride standpoint as well too. And, and you know, we need to still make things in this country and you know, we need to manufacture our own steel. And, um, and when you have pipelines being built or bridges and it doesn't contain any American steel, uh, you know, I, I have a problem with that fundamentally. And fundamentally, it seems like society changed a little bit. Uh, oh, society changed dramatically. Like in the 1950s and 60s, it's, it was more equitable. 
the, the C, corporate CEO didn't make 250 times. Sure. Uh -huh. uh, and then you started having, I, I don't think it was only uh, Reagan, but uh, more of this uh, greed is good philosophy. Sure. Well, I mean, it, it, I think it was the expression, the rich get socialism and the poor get capitalism, I think best exemplifies what happened to this region. It's like when the mills were closing and they were falling like dominoes up through the valley, um, it was, well, that's that's what happens in capitalism. It's cheaper to build it in China. And, and I think the fundamental, like when I studied economics in school and in graduate school, it, it always bothered me that labor was treated like an input of manufacturing the way raw materials were. And it's like, it's not labor, it's human beings with families and communities. And they teach, you want to get it for the cheapest price possible. And you want to beat down you know, workers and, and, and it's just not fair. And, and that mentality was so pervasive and I think that helped fo foster this uh, climate that allowed these jobs to be off-sourced, outsourced so easily. Contrast that, what happened in the late 70s and 80s, with what happened during the financial crisis in 2008 and 2009, and they couldn't marshal enough resources quickly enough to save the banks and shore up all those jobs and shore up financing when those were the very individuals and organizations that caused this disaster in the first place, uh, as opposed to uh, forces outside the control here. So from, of course, technology changes, and I don't want to use a typewriter or you know the buggy whip factory, but at the end of the day, steel has remained largely the same um, and we still need plenty of it, and why can't it be made in the United States when it can be made in this country uh, better than in other countries? It's just they don't have environmental concerns, they don't pay living wages, they have no, um, no uh, worker safety, so it's, it's, it's not that it's more efficient in China or other countries, it's just when you don't have any rules, of course it's going to be more um, and more cheaper, but ultimately we all pay in terms of climate change globally, but here locally you can see it all throughout the valley and in western Pennsylvania. And uh, it seems like there's a bit of a domino effect where you have these industrialized uh, areas in, in the Rust Belt that were deindustrialized. People get laid off, they no longer could save for their uh, kids' college, they're just scraping by. Then children with these crazy college prices have to take out hundreds of thousands of loans, and it, it's just generational. I just spoke with a few in Altoona who had to drop out of school because they realized, like, I just can't afford to pay sure. these loans back. Do you feel like um, pretty much what you said, banks, we, we, gotta, we gotta prop them up, but there's less of, a, less of a concern among government of an urgency to help our, our young and our- uh, Well, the, the banks, they have to be stop behaving so shittily, first of all. I mean, it wasn't, it was their own conduct and it was the derivatives and it was the subprime mortgage scandal that caused that it wasn't that banks you know just were losing jobs and they needed to to be you know forces outside their control this was a process bought on by about uh conduct illegal conduct and the ceos have been buying their way out of prison time there uh, there's very few if anyone that's actually been convicted and doing any time for massive amounts of fraud and 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 it really helped wreck the economy and communities that were already struggling whether it's altoona or whether it's my community or mckee's port or take your pick um only suffered further and that's it's just not fundamentally fair and from my standpoint um nobody says well we can't afford to pay this ceo 18 million dollars but they sure say well we can't afford to pay someone a living wage and i find that outrageous Heather Bresch, who's the CEO of Mylan, who has just made the news recently uh, for jacking up the EpiPen prices, a generic drug maker, by the way, not doing any of their own original research, made $19 million. Now you're telling me that she needs, to get, she needs $19 million to get by, and everybody else out there who needs these life-saving EpiPens has to spend six times more now than they did in 2007. You know, I don't think anybody begrudges Mylan or any company of making a profit, but do you really, you know, how many yachts can you water ski behind? You know, do you really need to make $19 million as a generic drug maker? And uh, isn't part of it the revolving door between government, uh, banks, 
lobbyists, the media. It seems that a lot of these banks that put us into that spot, they donate to the, the politicians, the politicians well, well, start cutting regulations. I mean, I mean you, want to, you want to find out how pervasive and how toxic money is to the American democratic process, run for federal office, and that, that will be a crash course in just how um, money really cash is king in America. Can you politics. tell us about your experience? Well, it's just you have to spend hours on the day uh, cold calling. It's called call time. Um, if somebody has a check for you for $2,500 and somebody has a check for you for $25, you know, that's your new best friend with the $2,500 check, but with the $25 one, it's, it's just, and that shouldn't be, that's not democratic. That's not one vote per person. That's woo versus eh, and it can't be that way. And, and that's one of the things, um, that I would say that I was grateful for the Sanders campaign for, for demonstrating that you can raise enough money to be competitive in the post-Citizens United world by doing it with $25 donors. Um, and I think until we repeal Citizens United, the revolving door and, and you know, this, the, the media and this machine that's created by unlimited money, much of it can be dark money, um, it's going to continue to get worse. And uh, for you, uh, I, I might be wrong, but you were polling fairly well after your sec after your debate. You yeah, did very I, I, well. Yeah, that, that's the thing. It's it's like money money but counts. I just want to uh, tell the audience what happened because from what I remember, you were doing fairly well. You had some momentum. Then uh, then they started pounding you with money. Well, we 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 were outspent fifteen to one, and and I'm a big boy, and that's the way the race went. But at the end of the day. Um, I'm worried what it will cost to run for office when my son, who's seven, turns 18 and is able to vote. And unless we do something about Citizens United, and unless we do something about the trajectory that we're on, it's going to cost you know $10 billion to run for president. Uh, and that further empowers billionaires like the Koch brothers who can literally purchase a candidate um, and really not feel it, you know, in their own bottom line or the amount of wealth that they have. And could you uh, paint for the audience a picture of Braddock in particular, who, uh, like you said, the offshoring, similar to Altoona and other places, uh, what, what are the specific uh, consequences for the people here? Are they working two well, or three jobs? I, I mean, it's, it's it, 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 all these towns are dying of a broken heart. You know, they, they gave so much to America. They gave so much to um, what made the country great, what makes this country great. People are rightfully so celebrating Uber setting up shop in Pittsburgh, the driverless cars and all of that. It's like, well, where did, why is Uber in Pittsburgh? Why is Google in Pittsburgh? It's like, well, they're here because Carnegie Mellon has the best software institute and robotics lab in the world. Well, where did Carnegie Mellon come from? Well. It came from Carnegie, Andrew Carnegie, Carnegie Tech. Well, where did Andrew Carnegie get the money to endow Carnegie Tech, which is now Carnegie Mellon University, right across the street, with the sacrifices of the workers and their families uh, here in Braddock and communities just like mine. So I'm not suggesting we have our own West Elm and Whole Foods downtown, but what I am saying is, is that, and what this, my race was about, is that there shouldn't be such inequality and there shouldn't be such disparity between communities like mine and um, wealthy, gentrified, suburban, what have you communities. Um, and that starts with paying people enough to live in a dignified manner without relying on public assistance, allows them to take a vacation every summer, allows them to save for their children's education, that allows them to take paid sick days um, and that allows them to be there for their parents or for their children without working two or three jobs that you were referencing, because that's absolutely the case. And, you know, going around the country the last year covering the primaries, uh, what I saw identically at Bernie rallies and Donald Trump rallies, despite a different atmosphere for sure, was real uh, fear. Uh, just last night I was interviewing someone at a Trump rally, and he started crying because he's his company's laying people off. He just missed the last cut, sure. but he's, he's afraid. Yeah. And I'm sure you see in your, in your community. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, we just, we had a, a situation here at the mill six months ago. They were uh, not getting a contract. There was a local uh, community um, uh, uh, that was locked out 
you know, for, for six months through the holidays. So uh, there is a lot of fear, you know, it's, and it's, it's a return to populism. Uh, and uh, I think Sanders mind the, the, the bright side or the, the positive side of populism and Trump gets his energy and feeds off the dark side of populism. People don't realize, or I don't hear it discussed, the revolution that's occurring in the Republican Party turning their back on free trade. That would be like the Vatican embracing birth control next month, you know? It, it just goes against everything that they've ever stood for as long as I can remember. And that's being led by Donald Trump. And I don't think for a moment that there's anything sincere about it. I think it's just a pragmatic play to, to win the election. But nevertheless, I think it is positive conversation that needed to happen is how much free trade is ever fair trade for American workers and companies. And the way my community and others have ended up, I would say very little of it has been. Well, that's a good segue because you hear President Obama often and, you know, all these people in D.C. talk about, you know, it's a globalized economy and, you know, the nostalgia for the old days, the jo those jobs aren't coming back. And they talk very matter of factly about the advantages of globalization. It seems to me that they didn't really take into account when they became players in the global market. What was the plan for the displaced workers? Well, I tell you what, it, it, is, it is great news if you went to Harvard Law School or you come from a background where you don't have to worry about these kind of things. But when, if you're stripping out the manufacturing base that provided lifelong job security and stability and family sustaining jobs, and you replace them with crappy service jobs that pay eight or nine dollars an hour, and you wonder why so many Americans are on food stamps, you wonder why so many Americans are living in poverty. If you're going to strip out through trade the, and make it more efficient, quote unquote, then it's incumbent to make sure that these jobs that are replacing the former manufacturing uh, jobs pay enough for people to live comfortably on. And that was never accomplished. That was never taken into consideration. And, and, and like I said, I marvel at no matter how much a CEO makes in bonuses, that's okay, but you want to pay somebody working at Sam's Club or wherever, make $15 an hour to support themselves and their family. Oh, oh my God, we can't have that. Uh, and it's, it's, it's infuriating and, uh, and, and it's unfair. And sure, there are winners when it comes to globalization and free trade, but there are a lot of quote unquote losers too. And you can't expect those people to continually vote for a concept that has left their communities um, barely hanging on. It seems like pretty much since the, the 70s, 80s, uh, Democratic Party shifted to the right, the Republican Party has shifted, who the hell knows where they are now. Um, how do you kind of take uh, the focus that's been spotlighted on town areas mm -hmm. like this and actually create change if whoever sure. is the president is still going to be beholden to the special interest. Well, I mean, you're, it gets back to what I said earlier. You, you know, the special interests are special because they can put money. And if you put money into a race, you get the changes and the attention that you want from elected officials. You strip away that, you're going to get a much more honest representation of what the people want. And nothing is more true in terms of that than gun control regulations um, or environmental reg regulations. I mean, like if you walk out your apartment and it's 92 degrees at the end of September, like that's not normal. Like September is the new August now and it's the hottest month on record. So like, this idea that um, special interests are only special because they can give money. Money is only important because the more money you have, the more easy it is for you to win a race. If you flip that formula and strip that out, it'll, it'll radically change American politics because the candidate, he or she with the best ideas and the best campaign will actually win as opposed to somebody who can, can you know, blast their name out across the airwaves. And uh, last question, you know, Bernie talked about the disappearing middle class. I'm going across the Midwest, mm -hmm. kind of looking at that this week. And uh, if, you, if you had an economic message to the people in D.C. on why uh, empowering these consumers in towns like this uh, with higher minimum wage, uh, better, better pay, better working conditions, better health care, mm -hmm. how it helps e even the wealthy uh, do better. 
What would be your message to them? I, I, throughout my own campaign, I always said, we're all better off when we're all better off. And if you're some lobbyist or you're someone living in the bubble uh, in, in Washington, D.C., making a quarter of a million dollars as a lobbyist, you know what? Good for you. But why on earth would anybody begrudge somebody that's working at Starbucks or making you know, your Big Mac the ability to live with dignity? Now, to me, I think one of the most important things that we can do is reset the minimum wage. It's currently at $7.35. We allow a human being in this country to break his or her back for $7.35 an hour, and that's legal. And that's outrageous, and that's first and foremost that has to change. And you can't wring your hands over what's happened to the middle class when you haven't taken any progressive steps forward into making sure that this is a healthy, thriving um, segment of our society. And you raise the minimum wage, you help with student loan debt, you make health care and shore it up as a right, not a privilege, and you at least establish the public option for Pete's sake. You wonder why insurance companies are leaving the exchange? Because you don't make a lot of money insuring sick, poorer people. So that's why you have the public exchange. Um, you make the college debt uh, and you make college more affordable. All these things can shore up the middle class and take care let people take care of themselves in a way that the decisions that have been made have, have stripped that away from them. And, you know, people out here are getting attention now and like, well, it's going to come down to Ohio or Pennsylvania and the middle class. It's like, you know, but there's always going to be that cynicism and that doubt in their minds that once the election's over, it's like back, back to business as usual. And I want to believe that that's not going to be the case, you know, you know, when Hillary Clinton wins. Um, you know, as somebody that ran a progressive race at the federal level for Senate, all I can say is, is that until we fundamentally get money out of politics, until we fundamentally do things that nurture the middle class, you're going to con continue to see society spread out in two separate different directions. And the longer that goes on, the harder it will be to reconcile them. Already we live in two silos. You, your worldview is either Huffington Post or Drudge Report, you know, and you open them up side by side. Half the time it doesn't even look like they're talking about the same country. And I am worried for the direction our country is taking. And I hope that the Democrats win and that we're able to enact some of these policies that are long overdue. Thanks so much.